So I'll be speaking about the spectrum of inhomogeneous random graph. This is a joint work with uh, Luca Avina and Nandan Malhotra. So Nandan also gave a poster. Uh, Luca, unfortunately, is on the flight somewhere. Uh, uh, we don't know. Maybe by the end of the talk, we'll know whether he has landed or not. So, but this builds up on an earlier work uh, with Arijit uh, Chakraborty, Frank Dan Hollander, and Mateus Fragara. Also, so I'll be speaking a few things uh, which uh, we did uh, long back, about five years back, but uh, they come to be relevant. So uh, I'll not. I'll, I'll briefly indicate to the literature and everything. So, but let me start off with what my setup of this model is. So as, as I will be talking about inhomogeneous random graph, so my setup is I have a set of vertices, so which will be 1 to n. So this is the set of vertices 1 to n. And uh, on these vertices, what I'll do is I'll assign weights. So I have a collection of non-negative weights. Uh, these are just non-negative deterministic. So I'll not be talking about uh, random weights here. Uh, there are spe specific reasons which I'll mention uh, later. My edge uh, probabilities are all independent. So edge, edges are assigned independently. And it's an undirected uh, graph. And the connection probabilities, Pij between two vertices, is given by, is of the form epsilon, which depends on n, f of wi, wj, where f is a function from 0, 1 square to 0 infinity uh, bounded. Uh, we'll assume continuous also for this, uh, for this talk. Uh, weights are always, uh, yes, uh, so that's also not needed. So I could, in fact, that's a good point. I could always also take here. So they need, they need not be on zero one also. So the calculations don't affect us. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so this is kind of uh, bounded is a very crucial assumption in this. Uh, we, without boundedness, we cannot even make this less than one. So what we'll assume is that Epsilon n goes to zero. This is a crucial thing that I'll have my epsilon n's very small. And uh, so the thing would be, so let's see some examples which we have seen throughout this week. Uh, one of the classical examples is, first example is f equals to one. This is our favorite graph at the Schrödinger graph. And the second example, which Nelly was talking about. So if you take f of x, y, say x, y, minimum one, I'm just making it bounded uh, by minimum one here. Next example is, so this is, uh, let me call this Chung Lu graph. So f x, y is x, y by one plus x, y. So this I'm calling it to be the generalized random graph. So I'm trying to use all the notions or the names which are in Remco's book. So and fxy is one minus e power minus xy, which is the norris to graph. So these are some typical examples. And, and one of my favorite weights in some of these examples would be that we'll assume the weights to be, say, i by n also when you are considering like this base space is zero one. So we'll be sometimes on the grid uh, or a box of zero one and, and we'll look at just these points. Another crucial assumption, so this is the standing assumption on the weights we'll put, that let O n be an uniformly chosen vertex from one to n. So A O n is just, you choose one of the vertices. You look at the weight of this, vertex, so you choose one of the uniformly chosen vertex, you, you look at its weight, we assume that it converges to a random variable w, uh, which has, say, law mu w supported on zero infinity. So, so this is the 
whole setup for me, and this is my standing assumption, in many of the cases, what I'll have to assume due to some technical aspects, you will see that this measure has to be compactly supported. So in some of the examples, we could not go beyond compact support, but this is the question. Okay, so now given this random graphs, so there are two regimes we would like to consider. One, I call it the dense regime where n times epsilon n goes to infinity. So this is the roughly the average degree goes to infinity. And this is the sparse regime where n times epsilon goes to some lambda in zero infinity. Now, the idea is, so can we somehow, so we'll see what kind of properties, how close are the properties of the sparse graph if we tune the parameter to be large enough, are close in some sense to the dense graph. So can we approach or conquer something from the sparse graph properties or, or can we determine some sparse graph properties from the dense graph or vice versa in a way. So one of the things we try to analyze here, uh, which might not be the best thing to do, but still it's an important quantity, is looking at the eigenvalues of the adjacency matrix. So what is my adjacency matrix? It's just a, a zero one matrix if, uh, so the entries of this matrix are zero one, if you have an edge between i and, z, i and j, and if you don't have an edge between this. And this is a symmetric matrix. It has n eigenvalues, lambda one to lambda n, and they are all real. So what we will be interested in is to look at what we call the empirical spectral distribution of this. Okay, before that. Uh, No, 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 I'll, you'll see what the results are. There will be difference in, so these are two assumptions I'll make. And yes. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, okay, I shouldn't use, so, so this is just the edge set, say EN. Okay, this is EN, the edge set uh, in this. Okay, so, so what I'll do is I'll scale my adjacency matrix. So I'll define an tilde to be an by square root of n epsilon. It will turn out that this is, so I'm dropping the subscript n from the epsilon, but it will always depend on n. So, um, so I'll scale my matrices by uh, square root of uh, n epsilon. And these eigenvalues I'll consider to be the eigenvalues of a and tilde. So I don't care about the scaling at every point. So what I'll be interested in is in this measure, which is also known as the empirical spectral distribution of a and tilde. So this is just putting mass one by n and on each of these eigenvalues. Okay. So the question is, uh, so this is a random measure because my graph is random. So where does this measure converge to? So this is the broad question we want to answer. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go forward, but I'll state the main results first, although they are not really the main results because there is something more which will be coming up. So theorem one, so this was, this is a work which is culminating for many works for many different graphs but I tried to write this as a general result. So under all these assumptions, and let's put this as the dense case, as n epsilon goes to infinity, uh, we have that mu n weakly converges to a measure mu f in probability. So in probability is with respect to the graph randomness. No, that's a standing assumption. I have, so I have kept this as a standing assumption because, because to make this PIJs less than one, 
So I have made this as a standing assumption that epsilon goes to zero. So, <clears throat> so this is the measure. I'll explain, I'll go through slowly on what properties of this measure is known and how does it look like. But before that, I want to compare this result also with the sparse case. So sparse, so this is the work with uh, Nandan uh, and Luca Avina, but it also follows uh, from a work by Bordenav Lelage uh, on local weak convergence. So, <coughs> so mu n is converging to a measure mu lambda. And these two measures are deterministic measures. Mu f is a deterministic measure. Mu lambda is a deterministic measure. And this is also in probability. And the third result, so this is the third result. Yes. So, so this is, sorry, this is the sparse case. This means that n epsilon converges to lambda. So this is the sparse case. So this is n epsilon goes to infinity. This is n epsilon goes to lambda. So you have two different measures. Now the question is, how does these two measures compare with each other? So the third result says that mu lambda converges to mu f as lambda tends to infinity. But this was not the target. We, when we started, we thought that, okay, it will be a very, very hard task to prove this, but we'll possibly prove this in a way. The open thing, which we could not prove, and that will come why we could not prove it, is still that the total variation distance between mu f and mu lambda is capital O of one by lambda. So why I'm making this conjecture, I'll, I'll come shortly in the proof. Uh, so this is um, our conjecture that the measure you see in the dense case or in the sparse case is sort of in total variation distance, very close to the dense case. So they are, they are not too much difference, though, although qualitatively you will see that there are lots of differences when lambda is small, but when you let lambda little go be big, then you don't see too much of the difference. Yes, so both of them depends on f. So, so yes, I'll come to it. I'll, I'll come to it. That's so I haven't. So these, these are very abstract results. I haven't told you how this looks like or this looks like. So this is just the just to tell you what the picture is. But now my rest of my talk would be to explain you what these two measures actually are. Yes, there you go. No, nothing. So in some cases, what I said, when you do examples, uh, there is a bit of a restriction. It's a very good question, uh, which we realize much later because of this assumption and the assumption, this one, sometimes to calculate some of these examples, we need the mu w to be compactly supported. And that essentially means that you have all the weights, all the, all, all the moments finite. So that excludes some of these power law cases in a way. But sort of we thought, okay, let's go forward with all the simple cases and, and let's do everything. Yeah, the question is, since all the Fs are already between 0 and 1, yes. if it's overall uh, epsilon, so it's not only... No, no, if it's not between 0 and 1, if it's just bounded. But all the examples you're making... Yeah, 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 this is between 0 and 1, so you can consider 0 and 1, that's... So is upper bound for the density. Yes, yes. So, so most of my examples, this would be restricted to zero one uh, square. Because what will be, uh, I'll show you like, it's easier when you write it down in terms of zero one square, you, you see easier expansion. So I think Kumarjit had a question. Lambda, I, I'm not putting it because it will be more confusing if I put a, F here also, but it does depend on F. So this, these two both crucially depend on F, what F you are choosing. Yes, Nelly. Uh, 
mu n is the empirical distribution of the eigenvalues. This is just, so these eigenvalues are the scaled eigenvalues of uh, the adjacency matrix. So I have scaled everything by root n epsilon and, and then looking at the eigenvalue. No, it's a, it's a constant. So this belongs to zero infinity. So this is a, this is a constant. This is the sparsity parameter. So yes, so this is, this is parameterized by lambda. So lambda plays a crucial role in the parametric sense. No, no. So what you do is you fix a lambda where this converges and then you have the result. So this gives you in lambda sequence of measures, but if you let this converge, so as lambda goes to infinity, these measures will be close to the mu f. Yeah. Uh, Arit, you had a. Let's not keep another notation for it. Uh, no, no. I yes, I, yes. I'll, 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 I'll let me come to that. So I'll, I'll explain how. Uh, yes. No, all of this is, uh, uh, this is expected. So I'll, I'll come to the literature. I haven't spoken about the literature at all. Uh, it's, it's not, none of this is surprising yet. So, okay, so let me. Uh, I think the setup is clear, so I can erase this part of the setup. So, <clears throat> and also the examples. So due to time and, okay, uh, tiredness, I'll explain you one of the crucial examples, which is F equals to one. That's the simplest case. Now, mu F, in that case is mu semicircular law, which looks like, so this is just the, which has a density. So this density looks like this. So it has a density of the form. So four minus X square, square root of four minus X square. So this is the law. And this is, uh, you don't need reference because this comes directly from the Wigner's result in 1954. It was quite general, so you do the same calculations and, and this follows. No, because I'm looking at epsilon going to zero, you can get rid of the centering case. So otherwise you will need to be centered. So that's why I'm, I put this simplifying assumption that uh, this is there. Okay. So in the case, <coughs> okay, so this is well known. So what about mu lambda? So mu lambda turns out to be much more difficult than the simple curve. So the first simulations of this measures were done uh, by Bauer and Goninelli uh, in two papers in 2000 and 2001. So they were the kind of, uh, they just didn't do simulations, but they also said how to look at these things in a very critical way. And it's, it's one of the uh, crucial physics papers which kind of led the uh, research direction here. Okay, so since I'm not using slides, let me point out three figures on how this looks like. So first I'll point out what is, say lambda equals to 0 0.8, what happens in that case. In that case, the curve looks with lots of, in fact, atoms in it. So it's uh, the measure is, like it seems like it's completely purely atomic. When you put lambda equals to two, okay, so this is a, so if you do that, look at the paper, then you will find, uh, so lambda equals to two starts looking like this. When you go to lambda equals to eight, you really see something like this. So, this already at lambda equals to eight, you see that this picture resembles this with a very little perturbation to the picture. And this is what, which started our research project, 
that we thought that, okay, even at lambda equals to eight, you see that the sparse case is close to the dense case. So you, you don't need huge lambdas. So lambda going to infinity is an overkill uh, when you want to say that the measure is close to this. So this was, this is all for sparse Erdoshrini. So sparse, just Erdoshrini, they, they made. So this was more rigorously proved. Uh, so the existence of this measure, uh, yes, you had a, uh, the boundaries, okay. So I'll, I'll come to it, but it has an unbounded measure. So it's a, so the density, so it, so it's not like, so here you have minus two, 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 but this has an unbounded measure. So when lambda increases, so slowly the support decreases to a compact measure in, in a way. So this was rigorously proved uh, by, so this is a remarkable paper in this area by Bordenave and Lelage. So uh, this was uh, 2008, it came into an archive. In 2009, it was published. And uh, later there were many other works which they proved a much general result. They said that, okay, if you take a sparse graph, if you have the local weak limit, then you can show that the empirical spectral distribution will converge to a limit. And they even gave in some cases, so if you have an unimodular tree, so this was done in uh, more uh, recent works with, so formalizing more recent works with uh, Justin Sales. So, <clears throat> yes. No, no. You, no, the general result says that, okay, okay, under some uniform integrability conditions on the degree distributions, uh, well, some higher moment conditions would do it, you could get the limit. Okay. But identification of the limit requires that you, you need to be on the on the tree. Because if you're not on the, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a bit more. So, so what is known about this measure? Still, what happens is mu lambda is related uh, to a Galton-Watson tree with Poisson lambda distribution. So what you do is you start with the root and you take your standard Galton Watson tree with uh, Poisson lambda progeny distribution. And what you do is you scale, so you put an edge weight of one by square root of lambda on each of these edges. So what you get is an, uh, so if lambda is greater than one, you get an infinite tree. And so if you look at the adjacency operator of this uh, infinite, sometimes infinite tree, uh, then this measure is sort of a spectral measure which comes from this A infinity. So for simplicity of time, I'll, I'll not go into expressions. So what you can show, so one important characterizing thing about these measures come from what is known as a Stelius transform. So a Stelius transform of a measure, say I'm taking mu lambda to be the measure at Z is defined to be an integral like this for any Z in the upper half complex plane. Yes, uh, sorry, yeah, correct, over X, yes. So for any Z in the complex plane, so what they showed is that S mu N Z really converges to S mu lambda Z and uh, and they gave a nice recursive expression in terms of these trees uh, for the expected uh, distribution. Is that because uh, in this setting in a single lambda, the degree goes to Poisson lambda distribution? Absolutely. And, uh, sorry, no, it's... it's uh, yeah, because if you look at the adjacency operator, like, uh, so if you write down these Stelius transform measures, so what happens is you are doing a local decomposition and then it becomes a local function. The difficulty comes is, okay, there is a technical difficulty on whether this is a self-adjoint uh, operator or it's a, it has a self-adjoint extension 
uh, always. That requires a lot of effort to prove that this has a uh, self-adjoint extension in, in this. OK, so the other thing which is known about this measure, OK, still it's, it's still there is no complete expression for this measure. So what is known is this mu lambda is absolutely continuous if and only if. So not absolutely continuous has absolutely continuous component if and only if lambda is greater than 1. So if a tree is infinite, this measure has an absolutely continuous component. So it has a density. And this you see from the picture also that the density starts appearing. Now the question is uh, whether this has, what kind of atoms this has. So this was, uh, let me put it here. So, so atoms of mu lambda are dense. And they can be expressed in terms of uh, uh, algebraic polynomials of certain degree. And, and this was proved by Sales uh, in 2016, just in Sales. What is not known, so in this, even in the simplest case, is that is there a non-trivial uh, Yes, non-trivial continuous singular component. Because in some sense, what happens is the spectrum in, in, in small lambda has a quite a bit of fractal structure which is hidden in it. So it's not clear that whether there is a non-trivial continuous singular component to this measure. And this is a open question. I, I don't know, at least in the paper in 2016 or something, uh, uh, just imposed this as an open uh, conjecture, but I haven't seen works uh, which kind of addresses this question, even in the simple case. OK, so this was, uh, you can see already from this that to understand this measure, uh, that there has been lots of work. Uh, uh, so we also started looking into it in a bit different view without trying to use the local weak limit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they, they have, for example, these atoms are related to leaves of certain trees. So, so there, there is explicit interpretation of these atoms. In, at least in the homogeneous case, you could, uh, or or in simple cases, you could relate it to uh, these. So one crucial thing is that your limiting tree should always be unimodular. So in the sense that whenever you look from any side, it should look the same. Otherwise, these, these, all these theories fail. But again, unimodular is most of the trees we see around. Uh, it's hard to find non-unimodular trees. Huh? No, this is some atom is there, but I'm not drawing. So this is a curve which is fitting the histogram. So you could see there are atoms which kind of uh, pointing around a zero. Yes. So for lambda less than one, that's yes. a finite tree almost surely. Right? This is a finite tree almost surely. Right. So, okay. And uh, so there's a clear space for this is lambda equals to one. Yes. Kind of critical, uh, yes, lambda equals to one. I don't know what happens. Yes, I don't know uh, exactly what happens in lambda equals to one. Okay. So that, that's, that's true for all lambdas, I think. No, 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 this is not, uh, sorry, sorry. This is not true for all lambda, lambda less than one. Sorry, this is uh, dense, okay, this is, this is lambda less than one. Because it's, it's comparing with the trees and the leaves with the algebraic, finite algebraic polynomials. So it's, uh, you need this, because the coefficients come from these finite trees and, and, and all these things. So, so lambda is less than one in that case. Uh, there are initially, I don't know, say if you take, so what we know is this measure is completely absolutely continuous 
this measure is absolutely continuous if your f is bounded away from zero. This me and Arijit proved long back. Now, if you show that for large lambda, this is very close to this, it's, uh, I won't have the courage to say that at which lambda you start stop seeing these atoms. Yeah, they, they will start reducing in, in that case. Uh, and any questions? Yes, this, but, but I, I cannot say at which point, maybe it vanishes also like completely. So this, this is not very clear to, yeah, this is, this is not, not very clear to me. Yes, they, they have to vanish completely. So this is, okay, this is uh, still for lambda at least say greater than some lambda naught. Like I, I don't know what, what this lambda naught should be. It should be for at least some large lambda, but I don't know where, which threshold I should uh, kick in there. Okay, so this was uh, now coming to some of the properties of these mu f. And so let me talk a bit about the moments of mu f and mu lambda, and then I'll I'll tell you uh, what this is. So to describe these moments, I have to go to a generalization of uh, these graph homomorphism counts. So let H be a simple graph of on K vertices. So I define this quantity T H F mu W. So is the integral over say, let me take for simplicity zero one to the power K. So it's uh, everything I don't have to bother about. So A is a uh, neighbor of B in the graph H. And then you look at F of XA, XB, D mu W tensor K with this so if mu w is a Lebesgue measure, so this is exactly the graphon, uh, the, the homomorphism densities in the, in the graphon. Now, the moments of mu f, the odd moments vanish. But let me write you an expression for the even moments of mu f as this is sum over j 1 to ck, where ck is a Catalan number. So this is a number which has this form. So one by K plus one, two K choose K. And then this is, so, so I'll explain what this is, F of mu W, where this collection T J K plus one, one less J less C K is a collection of planar trees on K plus one vertices. So planar trees roughly mean that you, you can draw the tree or cover the tree without lifting your, so you can have a walk around the tree without lifting your pen. I'm, I'm not saying the correct definition, but it's, it's roughly uh, in that sort. Yeah, so the simple example would be say, so this kind of a tree, but what you're doing is, so what you, you traverse like this, and then you can go back without lifting it. Yes, yes. So this is a, this is a well-known counting problem that if you have these planar trees, I'm, because it takes a bit of time, you can give the definition through the breadth, breadth first search also. So, and, and, uh, so but, but it's a famous counting problem that if you have a tree, planar tree, which has sort of an embedding in the plane, and if you're counting a tree with k plus one vertices, then the total number of trees is the cattle number. And uh, this number arises surprisingly in many of these uh, uh, random walk counts on, on random graphs also. So, so this is, this is, so you're looking at the copy of these trees inside your F in the limiting graphon. So for example, if you look at 
the second moment of this measure, then this looks like, so you're looking at a copy of this quantity in F mu w. If you are looking at the fourth moment of this measure, then you exactly have uh, two quantities. So, so, so this is the second, uh, fourth moment. So you can carry on in writing different moments. Uh, they, they're rooted, sorry. I, I should mention that, I, no, no, no. Yeah, no, yeah, they're, they're rooted. So planar rooted trees, it's a good point. It's a, because moments essentially count. So if you look at the expected moments it, of the eigenvalues, it counts the number of steps uh, which comes back to the ith vertex and, and then you sum over i. So essentially you are looking at random walks, these closed random walks on the, on the graph. And, and then you, the, yeah, you, you use trace expansions to estimate these uh, random walk uh, so on the graphs. Uh, exactly, exactly. On, yes, the, these are these are exactly the dick parts. So, <clears throat> okay. So for mu lambda, uh, this class increases a bit. So let me, uh, okay, spend some time uh, in what this class is. So I'm using this word, which is simple symmetric partitions. This was uh, introduced by uh, Bose and Priyanka Sen recently. But this was this comes from a more general class of partitions, which was uh, studied in uh, Pernici, or yeah, I, I don't know the where to put the umlaut yet. But uh, this is uh, this is a recent work. But they study sort of k-divisible partitions in this. So what is this class? So I take a partition which is v1, v2, say vm blocks. The condition is that if you look at so you pick a block you pick say one of these blocks, you look at the two consecutive elements of this block. In between the two consecutive elements, there should be even number of elements from the other block. Okay, I told it very fast, I don't want to write it. Let me give you some examples. Here when I say even, I'll count zero. So the simplest examples are the non-crossing partitions. So. So this is a partition, one, two in one block and three, four in one block. So if you look at the consecutive numbers, so one, two is a consecutive number. There are no elements from the other block, but zero is counted as even. So this is a trivial explanation, but if you look at one, four and two, three, say, so between one, four, these are consecutive elements. There are two elements, two and three from the other block. So let me, So I hope I did it correctly. So one, two again doesn't have anything, so zero. Two, five has three, four in them, so even numbers. Five, seven, uh, no, five, eight, it should be, right. Has six, seven uh, from the other block. And similarly, between four and six, you could see it did something. Yes, but, okay, this is why I, Partitions, I should, I should refer to my notes on, on the values. Yes. So one, two, five, six. Yes, one, two, five, six. And two, three, three, four, seven, eight. Okay. This makes more, more sense. Because between four and seven, now you can see that there are uh, these uh, five and six are there. So between any two consecutive elements in the block, you will find... Now this is, okay, this is a fancy way, but this class has a special uh, thing. So what we do is, uh, this side would be visible, Shiva, or no? Uh, from, on the Zoom, no, okay. Okay, so let me. So given a partition, okay, let me not do the complicated one. So one, two, three, four five, six, seven, eight. So let me take this as a partition. I view it as a permutation. 
So how do I view it as a permutation? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I assume that one goes to two, two goes to three, three goes to four, and four again goes back to one. Five goes to six, six goes to seven, seven goes to eight, eight goes to five. So I'm just viewing this as a, a permutation, and I take another permutation, which takes one to two, two to three. This is a cyclic permutation, which takes, say, eight to one. And then I multiply these two permutations. So uh, gamma compose pi. So I can write this down again. I'll copy my result. So one, three, five, seven, two, four, and six, eight. Okay, so what I do is I multiply these two permutations. I get a block decomposition like this of my numbers, which is again a disjoint decomposition. From this, I create a graph now. So what I do is I put one, three, five, seven in one block, six, eight in one block, and two, four in another, two, four in another block. And I start walking along the numbers one to two, two to three, like this. So I, I walk one to two, then I go back to two to three, three to four, four to five, five to six, six to seven, seven to eight. Now what I do is I collapse the multiple edges I get. So I collapse the multiple edges to get a tree like this. And I call this G pi. I root it at a block which contains my one. So this is my rooted tree, which I get G pi. Now I'm ready to explain you what the, uh, what the measure mu lambda's moments look like precisely. Okay. So, so this two kth moment of d mu f or d mu lambda, sorry. So the first term is same as what we saw in the other case. So this is the sum over j1 to ck of the copy of the trees uh, of k plus one vertices on f mu w. Then comes the rest of the terms. So the first term is lambda inverse. Then you look at all pi's in this class of simple symmetric partitions minus the non-crossing partitions, but they have block sizes uh, k minus one. Then you look at this tree which I have constructed f mu w. Plus it goes on lambda two with the block sizes now reducing k minus two. Again, g pi f mu w and so on. It goes on to, sorry, lambda minus two, lambda minus k minus one with mod pi uh, having only one block t g pi f mu w. Now from here, a consequence is A consequence is that if you look at the 2 kth moment of d mu f, uh, d mu lambda, it is exactly equal to the 2 kth moment of d mu f plus a term which comes from, so this depends on k, but the leading order is one by lambda from here. The difficulty is we could uh, essentially say a bit more if we knew how to count these partitions. I, I don't have a number which counts these partitions. This could be interpreted. So if I put colors on these blocks, this could be interpreted in some sense, uh, color rooted trees, uh, I, but I do, with certain properties, I don't know how to count them. So if, if one can count them precisely, you could get all these coefficients of here and you could get a higher order expansion. Now, this you can say that, okay, this shows the measures are 
close in some sense when you look at moments. But from moments to going to the total variation distance is not very easy. So you, you cannot go directly. You could use some other metric by like, uh, was, uh, not Wasserstein, but uh, more maybe, I don't know, uh, Hamming distance or something like that uh, you could use. Okay, the consequences of this result is that mu lambda has unbounded support because you could estimate these moments and you can show that mu lambda has unbounded support. Uh, mu f has compact support. That also follows from this estimate. Uh, mu f, okay, I said before that mu f is absolutely continuous. This is known from before. And both these measures are uniquely identified by their moments. Okay. No, they are not going to tell almost anything to me. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And that's why we started looking at an analytic method on understanding this measure. And so I don't have time, so I'll, I'll just briefly uh, tell you, because it's a, it's a sort of very interesting method, which was proposed by Korunzi, Sharbina, and... What's the third name, Nandan? Vengrovsky. Vengrovsky. Although I, I actually, they were the first one who tackled the Bauer and Gonilelli uh, conjecture, and they proved it. Somehow the paper has been lost in all these uh, works with Bordenov and others, and, and it, it doesn't get cited that much, and you, it's hard to find. And, and then we looked into the paper. It has a very interesting approach. So, <clears throat> so if you look at... So this is the five minutes I'll take. So if you look at the empirical distribution and the Stieltjes transform of this at Z, so this is nothing but one by N, summation of one by lambda I minus Z. And you could write this as the trace of one by N, the trace of the resolvent, or let's put it A minus ZI inverse. And this is, if I call this, the R resolvent of this matrix, then this is nothing but one by N, the diagonal elements of this matrix, I want to N. Now what you define is an, a new function, say take U to be a positive number, Z in complex half plane, then you define this number or functional, I U R R, I n, I want to n. So this is taking the exponential of these resolvents uh, out there. So what you see is, if you take the derivative, no, 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 okay, okay. So let's put an iota like this. No, this is this is an imaginary i here. It's, it's like a Fourier transform of this thing. But if you do a derivative with respect to u of this, you see this, this will come out. So Ri will come down. And then you evaluate it at 0. This exponential will vanish. So, so if you take g and uz, evaluate it at 0, you get iota times this s mu n z. Now, why is this helpful? Uh, the reason is, okay. so when you look at, so this is mainly for specialists or, or those who have worked once with the proof of uh, this, this resolvent. So if you look at this expression, Rin, you could apply the Kramer's theorem or the Kramer's decomposition of matrices to get that if you look at the diagonal element of this matrix, then you can write it in terms of Z plus, there is a diagonal term which I take to be zero, and you sum over K not equal to L, uh, R, K, L, and minus one, I'll explain what this is, A, K, L, A, oh no, A, K, I, A, L, I, an expression of this form. Where this is a matrix, so if you, so this is the resolvent of the matrix where you have removed the 
ith row and the ith column. So you have gone one dimension less. So that's why this n minus 1 comes in. And so this comes from the famous Kramer's or Schur complement formulas. Now the difficulty comes, the diagonal is expressed as an inverse of this. So it's 1 by something. And then it, it's a problem. But if you, these people had a remarkable eye in Abramovich and Stegen. I, I think most of you have seen this fat book with Bessel functions. So they have a remarkable identity, which says IUZ is equal to 1 minus square root of U, 0 to infinity, root V e to the power IVZ dV for any Z in the upper half plane. Now, you look at this formula, you, sorry, Z inverse, that's the crucial. One by, huh? this is a minus iota V. So, so if you look at Z here, so if you put this value, you get Z inverse here. So it's the inverse of the RII. And then you're back with the original form. And if you think of it, those Schrini random graphs, these are combinations of Bernoulli random variables, and you could apply a recursion. Okay, so I'll end here in the saying, this is the final result, that S mu and Z will converge to S mu lambda Z. And this, just then I'll take, then we go for lunch. So S mu lambda Z, let me quickly see the form is looks like zero to infinity e to the power minus lambda dfy zero to infinity e to the power iota vz e to the power lambda phi star y v by lambda dy uh, d mu w y Okay, so this is the expression uh, where phi star, I'll not explain, is a fixed point of an operator on a Hardy type space. So, and you have nice bounds for this phi star also. No, that comes from the fact that you're still in a tree. So there is a recursion which you can pull down to a fixed point equation on a Banach space. In the homogeneous case, it's easy to relate. That's related with the moment generating function of the Poisson random variable. Like, okay, it's a bit more complicated then, but in the general case, it's a bit more difficult. But you get very nice estimates because you'd be working on some nice hardy space to work on. And then we thought, is this very common? So my colleague, Evgeny Vabitsky, who works on continued fractions and ergodic theory, and he came that, said that this is very common in random continued fractions. This is somehow, it's a well-known operator in random continued fractions. They quite use it. There are very, very many well-known properties of this operator also known. Somehow this is not known, and I'll end my talk here. Thank you. Questions, comments? Just to have us say intuitive picture. So, right. um, uh, am I right if I imagine that I mean, when lambda is between one and log n, mm -hmm. we know that the, the the random graph is above the percolation phase transition. So there is a, a giant connected component, but not a unique component yet. So, are these atoms arising uh, as the um, eigenvalues uh, of the different small connected components? No, these these are like exactly measures. So if you see your tree, so you have to look at precisely the leaves of this tree. Mm -hmm. So these leaves are something which kind of controls where the atoms live. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I don't know. I, I, I say that I don't know explicitly. So in Bauer and Goninelli, in the physics way, they explain a lot of things about where this measure should be concentrated on, which I think needs a more rigorous study. But local weak convergence at least says that, okay, you are concentrated on, on these leaves uh, uh, where, where you see this atom. And it also 
So it's not just local weak convergence. There is a huge theory about algebraic integers, which play a crucial role in determining this also. So, so it's I, not I'm simply not very that you're, expert on this. It's not simply that you see these atoms no, vanishing no. when you have a unique no, no. connected component. There is component. no easy intuition on, 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 okay. on these, uh, these things. Okay. Thanks. But there are eigenvalues coming from the little trees, right? The, the, there are eigenvalues coming from the little trees, yes. Oh, that, yeah. that, that, that you have, so locally you have to see all these finite trees, how they, how they behave uh, in a way. You have n order n trees yeah. inside. Yeah. Yeah. Measure, right? Yes, you would expect atomic measure. So one thing to add that, okay, so we could now, using these methods, go beyond the local weak convergence because we are trying to understand the spectrum of the uh, scale-free percolation. And there you don't see a tree. So it's an infinite yeah. graph. And, and then it becomes these uh, fixed point theorems become very important there to understand this. Somehow the local weak limit is not saying much. But in case of inhomogeneous graphs, I think still local weak convergence has a lot of information in it. So I, I think Manju was first. Yes. Close to free convolution of mu lambda one and mu lambda two, do you think? Uh, that would be fantastic, but uh, I don't know if uh, I would love to make that conjecture, but I don't have no. big, because somehow mu f is related. So mu f is, so what is, they now call it the operator valued semicircular law. So it's, it has a semicircular law interpretation also, uh, in a way. But mu lambda, I don't see how to use, even for large lambda, how to use this freeness to uh, say something like that. Because if, if I can say something, what you're claiming, yeah. that would be really, really good because then you would have an explicit hold on what these measures are. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I, I won't have the courage to make that conjecture, but but that would be really, if it is true, if somebody else also proves it, it, it would be fantastic to see the result. Yes, Frank. So you're saying that you express this explicit expression yeah. that you have this linking you to <clears throat> To some distance. So what you can, okay. So thanks for asking this question because, because there are explicit identities which relate total variation distance between two measures in terms of the difference of the Stilges transforms of, uh, of those measures. So these are called bias inequalities. So if you know, so what we could show, it's not just only convergence. So our main result is that you could write this as equal to this plus an error term which involves the imaginary part of Z, it involves lambda in it. The only thing we could not get hold of all the errors in, in what we are doing. And, and that's why we could not get some distance out of that. And also some, so this inequality is a bit, uh, yeah, there, there, are, there are challenges in, in this inequality. Is this the case that you say, okay, is this connection with these random dynamical systems or just uh, uh, continuous fractions perhaps helping you to, to develop some more about what, what is, uh, you know, how you should view this? Or, or for the moment you say this, this is just an observation, okay, this looks like... No, this is an observation which I did not realize, but, but, but it's true that if you look at this formula, if you apply recursively, you start getting a, a continued fraction type thing. And this is very very reminiscent of, you could also relate random continued fraction with trees. So there is a relation. So there is a beautiful paper by Bhamidi, Evans, and I think Sen, which relates uh, these uh, continued fraction with trees also. So yeah, because of that recursion, which is very similar to what you get. It would be good to connect all this and see in one big picture, but uh, I don't know what this big picture is uh, still all about. Yes, it's it's a uh, it's easier to handle. Uh, yeah, semicircular law is very easy uh, in in this case, but yeah. In fact, like using this transform also proving semicircular law is quite trivial. Like it's it 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 follows easier than the original the 
So Nandan proved it once and, and showed that, okay, this is much more easier than the original proof. Okay. Mu f, f is equal to one. Yeah. So, so if you say, for example, that's a good question. For example, if you take Nelly's graph, the Chung Lu, you can write it in terms of free convolution of two measures. So there is this theory of free probability with which you can identify some of the measures there. So you, you know a lot about them. So if you, have, if you have expressions which are like finite rank sums, you could write it in. Yes, I, I give uh, not all I can write down, but if it's rank one or rank K, then I can write it down. No, 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 it's a, it's the shapes are quite different. So shapes are quite different uh, in that. I think we are running out of time, but I'll uh, take Shoman. No, they, these are, these are not uh, non-lattice. So there is no to total order or, so you cannot find a minimal element. Uh, so partial order is missing there. So that's a, that's a problem uh, in this uh, counting. So then let's thank uh, this and also 